Today we're going to be doing a catch-up on my moves that I have been making since the coronavirus situation has now matured, and I think people now more or less know what's at stake and what's going to happen. So we'll be going over my thoughts on the general economic situation, as well as my stock market moves and a lot of other minutiae. Let's get into it. So first we'll take a look at my performance, and uh, I made this joke on the Discord, but you know, I like to call myself the Chad, Eugene, what recession, what coronavirus recession, Chargrain. Uh, for the most part, the market downturn, well, I haven't exactly, you know, profited hugely from it because I don't believe in risky puts options and options contracts along those lines, but I didn't really lose any money. As a matter of fact, my investment goals as a result and my tactics haven't even really changed beyond the initial sells I did. You can see a dip there. Uh, it's a combination of the actual market, in fact, downturning, but also I needed to withdraw some money to make a tax payment for this year. So we're sitting on the year 2020 with a realized gain of about 1.13%. That's when I was just getting out of my positions and harvesting some losses. So that's what it's overall come out to. And the positions I'm still holding at this very moment are only down 6.91%. And I've got a healthy reserve of cash, even still. So you can see my open buys here and they're indicative of my ongoing strategy. My strategy is still threefold. I'm investing heavily in gene therapy. There's a long time horizon on that. Uh, I'm using the market downturn to build up positions in major pillars of the U.S. economy. So I like to look at the U.S. economy as really not that different from Russia's or even China's. And so what you have is you have these major mega corporations, pillar of the economies that are huge employers and producers. And the U.S. economy is so dependent on them, whether it be Boeing or McDonald's or anything else, that the government would simply would never, ever, ever allow them to fail. So if you got a point where the government is always picking up the slack, essentially you just have a state enterprise. So in these controlled economies, I like to be in the state enterprises because the market cycle doesn't affect them as much and they can't lose. So I don't see any purpose on playing anything differently. Before the pullback, they had nasty valuations, nasty PE ratios. They still do, but now is an opportunity to put myself into the general blue chip market and uh, side with the feds. Um, there's only so much you can do in an economy that is controlled as this one. Next up, one I want to draw specific attention to is BlackRock. Now what's interesting about BlackRock, and you can read about what exactly that company does in their own t on your own time, but it's been announced and this didn't get much attention you would see on the other investing channels and even in the news because this is not the kind of news they like to pay attention to. Uh, BlackRock was given heavy control over the over the Fed's equities purchasing program. So it's actually quite unprecedented that number one, the Fed is even buying securities and bonds and ETFs in the first place. Um, that's something you mainly saw in Japan and their central bank has always been on damage control for the longest time. But you know, we're living in a world now where the, the Fed is in fact buying ETFs and possibly even equities later on. And so it came out in the news that BlackRock was directing these purchases and I don't need to tell you about the thoughts that would raise in the conflict of interest, but if there's going to be controlled aspects of our economy, I don't see the point of fighting it. I'd rather be siding with the people who are um, controlling and directing it. So in this case, I'm going big on BlackRock. So as of now, I'm investing heavily in the company that's picking the winners and losers of the Fed purchasing program, as well as their own ETFs. The rest, like Church and Dwight, among others, and the major dividend ETFs, I don't need to explain. I'm just taking a position long on the U.S. economy during this time. See, the great thing about my strategy is that, and we'll come into this later when I talk about Joseph Carlson, the good thing about my strategy is that because I missed the initial drop, it doesn't matter which point I buy back in, because every single point I buy in in the long run is going to beat people who didn't sell at the top. So I know that no matter where I buy, I'm winning, no matter what I do, versus the people who held through the drop and didn't pay attention to the news. It's good to know that there's such a low bar for winning in this market for me. Now, I am concerned about inflation, as everyone rightfully is. And there are many different angles you can approach this, I found, and I'm not obviously listing all of them, but you can go for commodities like the gold and silver that everyone knows. Uh, but two, I think people need to put more time into consideration is uh, farmland, right? And also platinum and palladium. So out of all the um, commodities ETFs I've bought, SPP, the uh, Platinum Palladium Trust, has actually performed the best. It's the one I'm positive on. And Palladium obviously and Platinum have their uses, but they're not as traditionally seen as the cash alternative investment as gold is. 
Um, and the reason I actually don't like gold is that here's the reality with gold. Most of the world's supply is controlled by central banks, and central banks aren't very interested in allowing people to fly to alternatives when they're trying to manipulate their own currencies and flow them out with QE and money printing, right? Uh, QE would be pointless if there were safe alternatives and safe harbors to go to. So you have to be the only game in town. That's how the dollars maintain its value, despite the you know financial planning and programming the Fed has done and also all the other major governments, right? The U.S. dollar is more a concept of people's necessity and its faith in it, not its actual intrinsic value. And that will last so long as governments know that if they try to get off the dollar, they'll get more more Gaddafi'd or uh, they'll lose even more in every other currency or they can't purchase oil without U.S. dollars as well. Um, so when you have all the major central banks holding the largest reserves of gold in the world, what they can do is they can release gold to the market in concert with their QE programs. And you know, of course, they're likely discussing this with each other. They can flood the market with gold and silver that they control more than any retail investor or any of these trusts you can buy ever will, and just sell the gold to each other at the same time when they're doing massive QE pushes. And so that way, you know, the investor looks at it, gold doesn't perform well, they don't see it as a safe haven, and then what do you do? You stay in the dollar and treasuries and everything else. And I, I have to admit, it works. You're not going to be able to beat the Fed and the other major governments and banks doing that with their supplies of gold. You just won't. It's like you have a company where there's a, a float on the company. A float is the number of shares available for trading on the exchanges where only 1% is available for trading, right? And anytime insiders can dump or buy as they choose and the float is so controllable on that stock, you'll never really be able to overpower the people who are holding shares that are outside of the float, the free float of shares. So that's how I see gold as well. So I'll, obviously I'm buying it because at the same time it's not perfect. It sh I think gold should be running up more, but it won't. Uh, because modern monetary theory does in fact seem to work. It's a very powerful force and it's hard to defeat. I don't see gold massively losing its value, but it's not obviously performing on the upside as much as it should. Now what's great about platinum and palladium is that it's not on the same alternative commodities radar that a lot of these gold bucks are. And I don't think there's as much incentive for the central banks to attack it. And then, so at the same time, you've seen better performance on this. So I keep a close eye on it. Now, the other one I want to talk about is farmland. And so a company I've been buying is Gladstone Land. This is one I buy as much as possible very often. And these days, again, I'm buying little blocks of $100. Uh, just so, again, it takes about 10 days for me to invest $1,000, which is usually my, my block of investments. I think of every investment in terms of a block of $1,000. So... At the rate of $100 a day, it takes 10 days, and that means I'm really distributing my 40% cash reserve over the market, and I'll be, I'll be putting myself nice and, and slowly over the next many, many months. I'm not one of these people where as soon as the market dropped 8%, they threw all the reserves into Tesla, right? So you got to think of it like a Napoleonic battle. You can't commit your reserves too quickly. That's what I'm doing. I'm just now slowly committing my reserves to things like the commodities, still in gene therapies, the major pillars of the U.S. markets and the economy that they won't allow to fail, and also crucial alternatives like land, right? So one thing that's happening behind the scenes that I can't show you is that a lot of these wealth management and wealth advisory firms, they're obviously in a frantic frenzy conversation with their clients all the time. And one thing I'm noticing just from my own eyes seeing with all these wealth management firms that I'm privy to, many of them are comparing this coronavirus debacle, um, and don't please don't forget who to blame in all this, the blame relies on people who were overly positive, the incompetent medical establishment, the WHO and also the government, the entire system itself, but that's another story. Behind the scenes, despite what they're saying on the major news networks, right, that oh, Bill Gates is the only genius in all this, this is under control by the dip, the stock market's going to come back and make 7% a year no matter what. Behind the scenes, the wealth management firms are actually comparing this to the end of the Second World War in Germany and Japan. So there are three statistics brought to my attention. The first of two were Germany and Japan's experience after the devastation and destruction of the Second World War. In fact, those two countries, perhaps second only to the Soviet Union, were the most devastated by the conflict. So. During World War II, by the end of it, Germany lost 8% of its population, 26% of its housing, and 33% of its industrial production. Japan lost 4% of its population, 40% of its industry, and 25% of its housing. So that's important, right? So the coronavirus, if it were allowed to spread in an uncontained manner, in fact, sometimes you're seeing this death rate anyway, just because of health systems being overwhelmed, I'm thinking Italy. Anyway, but if the coronavirus were to spread uncontained, short of a total lockdown, you normally see a death rate anywhere between 1% to like 8%. 
And so that death rate is actually comparable to the population loss during the Second World War. So that's why you can see the comparisons that these wealth management firms are making. Um, now, we probably won't see the total population having that death rate, but you can see the damage it's inflicting as it cascades through the, the population. It's on par with the Second World War. And now what's interesting is the housing figure, right? So in Germany, 26% of their housing was lost, and in Japan, 25% of their housing was lost through destruction. Uh, we see a very similar uh, comparison happening uh, with the rent freezes, people missing rent payments, the mortgage industry exploding before our very eyes. And the fact of the matter is the feds won't be able to shore all this up. So if you're seeing a housing failure, an unemployment failure, uh, on par with damage in the Second World War after Germany and Japan, you can see that you know maybe you can draw some same comparisons from the recoveries that happened afterwards. And the statistics are not very exciting and they're a little bit depressing, frankly. Germany is the bottom of their GDP. I'm talking about even, this is after the wartime Germany economy, which is, I think it peaked in 1942. Germany's GDP hit a bottom compared to 1942 Germany in 1946. That was the very bottom of their GDP. And so even after the war ended, their market was free falling for another year. You didn't see a recovery to 1942 Germany levels until 1954. That's eight years. A lot of people aren't tuned in enough to the fact that this is big. Uh, and this comparison, while not perfect, is definitely a line of reasoning you want to be walking down. Now, Japan fared a little bit better than Germany. Their bottom of their GDP after the Second World War was 1945, and they recovered in 1952. That's seven years. Not a whole lot better. So many people are taking a look at farm production after the U.S. Civil War, which was a very devastating conflict. And they noticed that the very bottom of U.S. farmland production in the Civil War in the United States was 1865, and it fully recovered by 1869. So you can see it rebounded quite well. And so that naturally brings us into a company I've been buying very often, which is Gladstone Land. And if you listen to the earnings call from the fourth quarter of 2019, some very compelling arguments are made about farmland, about why this is an asset that you should think about at the very least during these times. Overall, farmland continues to perform well compared to other assets. Despite some recent downturns in certain regions, the Necreef Index, and this is a farmland index which currently is made up of about $11.4 billion worth of agricultural properties, including ours. They've averaged an annual return of about 12.3% over the past 20 years. And I think during that period, uh, it's 5.6 for the S&P index. And as you should know, that during those 20 years, the farmland index has never had a negative year, unlike the S&P, which I think has had six net years of, uh, over that same period, uh, negative years over that same period. Farmland has generally provided investors with a safe haven during the turbulent times in the financial marketplace as both land prices and food prices, especially fresh produce, have continued to rise steadily. In closing, please remember to purchase stock in, that you're purchasing stock in a company is a really long-term investment in farmland. This isn't a technology stock that you're going to wake up tomorrow morning and there'll be some big aha moment. I think investments in our stock has two parts that I love the most. First of all, it's similar to gold. It is a hard asset, dirt, farmland. It has an intrinsic value because there's a limited amount of it, and it's being used up by urban developers, especially in California and Florida, where we have many farms. And second, unlike gold and other alternative assets, it's an active investment with cash flows to investors. And we believe we, this is better than any bond fund because we can keep increasing the dividend. I think a good way to look at our farmland fund is a wonderful hedge against inflation. I think this is a great fund, and once we get a bit larger in terms of asset size, I hope that we'll get listed on the RMZ index. If that happens, it should bring in an additional institutional ownership, which hopefully will increase the price a little bit more and some more liquidity. I noticed that Vanguard, uh, who has the largest REIT fund, those folks recently purchased uh, a nice amount of the stock. The last thing I'm going to be talking about here are my cells. Not much interesting is going on with this. I'm simply dumping my treasuries and bonds. They serve their purpose. I made 2 to 3% on them. I'm using them to free up cash to buy commodities and other securities. But 
For the sake of the record, I am documenting. Thank you everyone for the continued interest in the channel. Despite my lack of time and uploads, it still continues to grow. I wish everyone safety in 2020, and I hope you all see that the time for change in the system is now. That's all for now.